uh, whiteboard area, what empowers you? And somebody took the liberty of circling the powers with yellow. And other people I noticed did not follow the instruction to answer below, and they answered above and beside. <clears throat> but we'll leave that aside. So what empowers people besides answering wherever they want? Feeling power versus being structurally power. Connections, network. I empower me, self-esteem, money, education, feedback, reinforcement. Support, freedom, lifting weights, that's interesting. Access, space, love, education and knowledge, education, digital literacies, people who are passionate, uh, ability to make choices. <laughs> I see somebody's editing the placement of things. Understanding new information, keeping my hair real short. That's interesting because for me it's exactly the opposite, right? Uh, me keeping my hair long is a form of personal empowerment. Um, Feeling power versus being structurally powerful. God, tools, running, yoga, recognition, connections. What what empowers you, George? Something must empower you because you certainly act empowered. Well, I don't. You, you've been reading a book of questions or something, Stephen, because you're throwing them out here, and uh, you know that's a. Uh, I'm going to throw that back to you, so you might as well uh, reflect on what you would like to do, and what you find empowering. I think one of the things I find most empowering is uh, mutual engagement. And I'm not quite sure how to describe that other than saying I find it uh, very satisfying to throw out an idea and have people react to it, build on it, and strengthen it. So I find engagement uh, or mutual uh, um, I don't know, entanglement, if you will, if I can use a term from physics, but I find that that sense in which we're part of something together. Um, I've always been a bit I felt a bit ill at ease when uh, people want sort of an expert opinion. And, and I remember when I first started teaching at Red River College, and this was in the late 90s, and I remember the sense of I hated being an expert. I hated the sense of, of having the answers for people. So I've always sort of moved more to the ambiguous side of things rather than to the certain side and the strong declarations. And you and I have actually had discussions of this online, and, and actually you've written a, a blog post on the vagueness of George Siemens. Um, and uh, Dave Snowden also has chimed in similarly uh, advocating a similar perspective. But I find it empowering to be in a place of not knowing. And what I mean with that more specifically is I find being in a place where we're trying to discover an idea or a concept together, but no one is standing up saying this is how it is. Uh, that, that's probably my most empowering state. Uh, I, I'm not empowered when I'm in a setting where someone's telling me what they've already discovered with a high degree of authority. And so that's something that I find uh, disempowering, if that's the right word. But to be in a space of not knowing with other people who are helping me and together we're trying to come to understand the phenomena, I find that very motivating. So but anyways, back to you. What do you find empowering, Stephen? Well, being able to write articles entitled The Vagueness of George Stevens. <laughs> uh, it's interesting that, that you find engagement to be empowering, um, because for me it isn't, not, e not even slightly. Um, for me, being dependent is not empowering, and I know you don't define engagement as dependence. But, but being able to be more autonomous, uh, being able to, to act, think, and decide without having to rely on others is to me a form of empowerment. I too don't like the guru thing um, where people ask questions and I'm expected to have all the answers. Uh, it's interesting how you've depicted your use, George, of vagueness and fuzziness as a response to the demand for power, or sorry, uh, for clarity, precision, and authority. When people ask me for clarity, precision, and authority, I interpret it as a request for, well, certainty and authority, but also simplicity. And you know, most of the things that, that we work with aren't simple. And so I go the other direction, uh, you know, when people ask for, for clarity and certainty, I say, well, 
if we become more precise about what we're talking about, we become less certain. And even even in this discussion where we're talking about power and authority, you know, we use the word oppression, the word oppression, the word power, these are very broad, vague terms. As we narrow in on them and ask, you know, what is the meaning of power? What is the meaning of authority? What is the meaning of oppression? What things oppress you? What things make you powerful? Our concepts get more and more precise, but they get more and more detailed, complex, and more difficult to manage. And, and the precise things that make me feel empowered and don't make me feel empowered are neither here nor there. I think what's really interesting and important is that even with the two of us, George, and, and you know, we overlap a lot, yet very different things make us empowered. And if we look at the screen, what empowers you, look at all the different things that make people empowered. And there are some contradictions on that screen, right? Um, the, you know, there's, uh, there were things that are inconsistent. Uh, keeping my hair real short. No, getting back to what you're saying, Stephen, I think this exactly this, this point that you raised about you know look at this list on the board. And so if you let's say if you're teaching a course and let's say you have uh, me in the course and Stephen in the course and we have two totally different views. Stephen will uh, finds empowerment in uh, you know being able to to think somewhat in isolation and being able to. Uh, you know, not being forced to collaborate with others. By the way, I hate being forced. I want to choose to collaborate. Anyways, that's Stephen's sense of empowerment comes through some of those areas of requiring uh, greater clarity and, and really bringing a philosopher's mind to the topic. Uh, I, on the other hand, find more empowerment in letting things stay a little bit fuzzy and not having to choose between two views on the same subject, as terrible as that is to say. I can frequently look at a political event and uh, I make a habit of reading uh, both you know, left-wing and right-wing uh, articles uh, on uh, different occurrences culturally or you know, politically. And I find myself being mutually enraged and, and at the same time, in some cases, nodding and saying, yes, this, this, there's some value there. So if you're a teacher now, and you've got these two people who have a dramatically different view of what's empowering and what's not, and let's say now you add another 30 people to the class, and you have some people who prefer having short hair, and you have others who are just passionate and uh, they want recognition, and you know they, they have a feeling of being satisfied being current in the field, the list goes on. So you have these different mindsets that people bring. How in the world can a course that is driven with one lecture primarily be empowering. Now I know courses aren't that black and white. I mean there's obviously some flexibility for interacting and forming networks outside of a school system or outside of a classroom. People do participate and interact online. I think our assertion with this course is that the greatest sense of empowerment comes from people having the ability to go out and make their own choices uh, in a space where there are diversity of option. 